Before we do any forecasting, it's a good idea to look carefully at the residuals of your model to make sure they uh, have the characteristics we expect them to have, that they satisfy the assumptions that we're making. So let me do an example. So this is the Facebook stock price data that we talked about earlier in the chapter. And uh, just plotting the, the data over time against the number of trading days since the beginning of the series. So we're going to fit a model to this and then look at the residuals of the model and check whether they satisfy the assumptions with, that we need. So the model we'll use here is a naive model. It's a very common model to use for stock price data. Um, so we fit a naive model and then the augment function will give us fitted values and residuals. It actually gives us two different types of residuals. Uh, it gives us the this column with dot resid, and it gives me this column dot in of. When we're testing uh, a model, we're always using the dot in of column. In this example, and in many examples, the two columns are exactly the same. Uh, they will be different for certain types of models, or if we've done a transformation of the data before we fit a model. In this case, uh, we haven't done any transformation, and we're using a very straightforward additive model. So the two columns are the same. So we want to look at that dot in of column and, and have a look at what characteristics it has. Notice that the first value is missing. Uh, that's because you can't get a um, forecast of the first observation because you don't know what was happening before that observation. But after that, they should all be there. Um, in terms of the notation that uh, we're using, that was introduced in the last section. Uh, y sub t given t minus one hat means the fitted value. So that's in this column. Um, the residuals um, we're calling et. Uh, and in this case, it's the same as the innovation residuals. Um, and to compute et for this particular model, uh, we just have to look at the difference between consecutive observations. That's because the fitted value is simply equal to the last observed value. So when we say y hat t given t minus one, that means using all the data up until t minus one. So the last observed value is at time t minus one. So y hat is equal to y t minus one. So this number, the fitted value at time two is equal to the observed value at time one. The fitted value at time three is equal to the observed value at time two and so on. And then the error, which is the difference between what you see and what you predicted you would see, is simply going to be the difference between consecutive observations here. So to say that again, this number is equal to this one, sorry, equal to this one minus this one, yt minus y hat. Now you'll notice that in R, it's rounding things off in the what it's printing out. So you 57.2 minus 54.6 is not 2.64, but there's more decimal places being stored under the hood. Um, and so this is actually an accurate calculation of the difference between those two things. Okay, so first thing up, we'll just plot the observations and the fitted values. Uh, they're very, very close uh, because it doesn't change much from day to day. Uh, and so the observation yesterday is quite similar to the observation today. And you see those two plots look very, very similar. Um, in fact, it's just one, one of the curves has shifted one day further on. If we take the vertical differences, or let, now first of all, let's go to the end of the plot so you can see a bit more clearly that they're just shifted. So the orange is the actual data. The blue is the fitted value. So you can see that it's just shifting it along by one day because you're on, you've forecast for the naive method is equal to the observation of the previous day. And then the residuals are the vertical differences here. So the difference be at each time point, the difference between the fitted value at that time point and the data at that time point. So that one's a big one, but most of them are much smaller. Um, so that's what the residuals look like from this model. Um, in terms of the code, we just take the augmented object and auto plot the residuals. Um, I'm using the dot resid column here. Uh, more generally, you'd want to use the dot in of column when you're checking the 
assumptions of the residuals, but they're the same here. And you can see that they're centered around zero, as you would expect. There's a few big spikes, the one that we noticed before, but a couple of others a bit smaller, but still sort of quite large relative to the bulk of the data. Also, it looks like there's a little more variation here than there is in most of the rest of the plot. So all of those things are suggesting that our assumptions are not quite right here. Let's do a histogram of the residuals. So here we're augmenting the fit. We're piping that into ggplot and saying, let's just grab the resid column, um, do a histogram. If you don't say how many bins, it will choose something automatically. Um, bins is the number of um, little bars that are shown in this histogram. And we're looking to see whether that looks normal. Well, it doesn't look normal, partly because of the outliers, this one, this one to a lesser extent, and also because it's a little more peaked than you'd expect from a normal distribution. So it's not quite normal. Uh, we look at the ACF of the residuals. Again, you can just pipe that thing into the ACF function and then auto plot it. They look fine. Um, there's this spike here just outside the limit, this one here just outside the limit, but we're plotting 30 spikes. So um, you would expect one in 20 to be outside to get two in 30 outside is not that unusual. Um, you can do all of the plots together using the GGTS residuals function. So you just take the fitted object uh, and pipe it into GGTS residuals, and it'll give me the time plot, the ACF plot, and the histogram. Uh, so that's a convenient way rather than all of those separate ggplot um, commands. Now, we are assuming that the residuals are white noise. That's the assumption that you make when you're doing a forecast. White noise here means that they have to be uncorrelated. That is no autocorrelation. They should have mean zero. They should have constant variance. If those things are not true, then this information left in the residuals that could, in theory, be used in computing the forecast and making the forecast better. Uh, it's not always easy to find a model that, um, that actually captures all of that information, but what the, these, if you see it, it's a correlation in the residuals, or you see that the mean is not zero or that the variance is not constant, then there's some information going on there that you could potentially exploit. Um, now, when I did this test, or when, when, whenever we do a, a test using the autocorrelation function, you're doing lots of tests simultaneously. You're testing whether, you know, whether at lag one, it's significant, at lag two, it's significant, at lag three, it's significant. And as we've seen, it's not unusual to get you know, one or two spikes outside the limit. So it would be nice to be able to combine those into a single test and in fact, we can do that using what's called a portmanteau test. Portmanteau is an old fashioned word that doesn't get used much anymore. My grandmother used to use the word to refer to her suitcase. It just means something that carries everything together. Um, so a portmanteau test is a test that combines a lot of things. Um, so here we're going to do a, a portmanteau test of all of the correlations, the autocorrelations simultaneously. So if you let R sub K be the autocorrelation of the residuals at lag K, then we want to consider R1, R2, R3 up to some upper limit um, at, all at the same time. So the first of these tests was developed by George Box and his PhD student, David Pierce. The same George Box that was the, uh, you know, introduced the Box-Cox test, and we'll, we'll see his name many times. He's probably the most famous person in time series uh, analysis. So Box and Pierce came up with this idea that if you squared all of the correlations up to some upper limit, lag L, um, then that's going to give you, if, if you've got a lot of large ones, then that's going to be a large number overall. Um, but if they're all relatively small, then that's going to be a small number overall. If you multiply that by the number of observations, it turns out that that thing has a chi-squared distribution, which is, means that we can do a, a nice test. Um, and you can compare it against the um, probabilities that you would expect from a chi-squared distribution to see whether the value of Q for your data set is bigger than you would expect by chance. If, if it's a small 
Q, then it's you know, the sort of thing you would expect by chance. And so you, you can say, well, the test is insignificant. If it's a large Q, bigger than you would expect by chance, then you say, well, there's significant autocorrelation going on here. P is after Box and Pierce introduced this test. Box was working with another PhD student, Greta Leung, and um, they came up with a modified version of the test, which is a little more accurate. So that's the one we will use. It's a little more complicated, but it has better properties. So it's still summing over the first L correlations, um, but it's weighting them. Uh, so this is the weight and there's a different constant out the front. But it also has an approximate chi-squared distribution. And so when we use, um, when we do this test, we when we do a test of all of the correlations, we tend to use the long box test. Now, of course, you have to choose L. Um, so I'd, I've done some experiments to try to find a good value of L. And uh, generally, L equals 10 for non-seasonal data seems to work pretty well. and um, it should be an L there. It's a mistake on my slide. So that's an L there as well. And if you've got seasonal data, L equals twice the seasonal period. So if for M is four for quarterly data, I would choose L equals eight. Um, if M equals 12 for, for monthly data, then I would choose um, L equals 24. It just gives you enough of the lags to see what's going on without having too many and harming the properties of the test. Um, so that seems to work pretty well. Um, now, if, if the data really were white noise, if the residuals really were white noise, then this statistic has a chi-squared distribution and you can compute the probability of getting a value as large as what you actually saw under the assumption that, that they were, that it did come from white noise residuals. Um, so we do that, we take the uh, augmented fit, we compute the long box statistic like this. You pipe the augmented fit into the features function. You say which column you want to use, what function you want to use. Uh, so we're going to use the long box function and how many lags you're going to include. This is non-seasonal data, so I'm going to use lag equals 10. And it comes back with a little tibble, which says what the... Um, the key was in the in the time series you started with, which was FB, what the model was, um, what the Q star was. So this LB stat is the thing that I called Q star on the previous slides and what the P value is. So the P value is the probability of getting a, a Q star value as big as this um, if the residuals really were white noise. And so we um, reject the hypothesis of white noise if this p-value is less than 0 0.05. Um, so that's sort of an arbitrary threshold, but it tells us you know, it's unlikely to occur by chance. Um, it's a sm small probability. Now, our actual number here is 0.276. So that's you know, pretty likely to occur by chance. So it looks like these residuals um, are not easily distinguished from white noise. So we accept the white noise hypothesis. Um, and so that's that's how you deal with uh, deal with residuals. Um, whenever we do a um, bit of model and uh, we're ready to do some forecasting, it's a good idea to check your residuals to make sure it satisfies those assumptions. Um, in this case, the autocorrelation was satisfied, but not the normality of the residuals. Um, that will affect the size of the prediction intervals. Um, in fact, whenever the whenever these tests fail, the autocorrelation or the um, the heteroscedasticity, that is, is the variance going to change or not, um, or the normality of the residuals, they're going to have an effect on the on the size of the prediction intervals much more than they will affect the point forecasts. Um, We'll talk a little later about how to deal with how to compute point for uh, prediction intervals if, in fact, you don't have um, Gaussian residuals.